Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome back to our shadowing session for Pre-Dental Universe. We're excited today to have Dr. Singh. He's an endodontist and he will be sharing his journey with us tonight. And we'd like to welcome him and uh, thank him for his time. And without any over the, let's get started. Okay, hi everyone. And uh, like she just said, I'm, my name is Dr. Singh. I basically, I'm practicing here in Chicago, so just trying to help however I can with this little virtual presentation. I'll try to be brief, not to waste a lot of you guys' time, because I know you guys are still in undergrad, still have a lot of chances to figure out what you're going to be doing, and dental school may be an option. You may still be exploring, but um, I'll just go briefly over my history and then what I do on a day-to-day -day and kind of some of the procedures that I do. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I will go into detail about the procedures, but I will try not to waste a lot of your time so that I can just kind of skim through it. So you can kind of see what life's like in a medical profession. Because a lot of times when you shadow any medical profession, you're not going to get the hands-on experience that you would, because you'll probably at this age get pushed aside. And in undergrad, I know for me personally, a lot of times I just got to do research and it was half the time on plants and something I was never really interested in, but it just was something to put on the resume. So without that, with that said, I'll start. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Yes. So basically I went to undergrad at the University of Miami. Um, when I was there, I basically was, my focus was pre-med with a major in biology. Uh, from there, I basically had options to go into medical school, which was kind of the track. And then I could have also gone to any other postgraduate school, be it PA, PT, uh, dental, optometry, pharmacist, et cetera or teaching and research, because there's really not much else you can do with a biology major. Um, so my goal was always medical school, but then I spent a lot of time at the VA in Miami and I shadowed, and a lot of it has to do with who you shadow. I shadowed a cardiologist and a spinal surgeon, was doing research with them, and they basically just scared the living daylights out of me. And it got to the point where they were telling me about how, I asked about hobbies, because I like art, I like drawing, I like other things, and the two people in particular that I shadowed kind of told me that they don't really have that and it's more about just work. So I basically went into a panic and I didn't know what else to do because again, I had a biology degree, I pre-med, I had done pretty well in the MCATs. I was just not sure where to go from here. Um, so one of my colleagues invited me to go shadow a dentist. I don't have any dentists in my family. So I went and I was a little nervous because the whole idea was kind of just new to me. But basically, I shadowed a dentist. I went there during the day. And basically, he was doing some exams. He extracted a tooth. He injected people. He went back into his office, watched some YouTube videos, some comedy, came back, uh, grafted a site, was getting site ready for implants, which was still about eight, 10 years ago. So it was still new back then. But this seemed like kind of an enjoyable lifestyle that I didn't find to be too bad. Although I didn't know anything about teeth, that's kind of where I ended up. So I began shadowing and the more and more I learned was, and you've probably seen this sign everywhere, but it's basically, you are a doctor, you are an engineer, you are an artist because you are recreating aesthetics for patients. At the same time, you are building up a structural component in their mouth, which is where the whole engineer thing comes. And that you'll learn about a lot in dental school. It'll probably piss you off quite a bit because you'll think your fillings look fine, your crowns look fine, but they'll tell you, hey, if they hit this the wrong way, they're gonna knock it off. Even though it seems like it's perfectly fine. But again, you are building a structural component in people's mouths. So that's where the engineering part comes in. You're gonna deal with patients all the time that have fevers asking about if something is systemically related from a dental infection, people in pain, people asking for antibiotics, people asking for painkillers. You're gonna to have to know about their systemic involvements, whether they're diabetic, whether they have autoimmune diseases, it's gonna dictate a lot of how you do treatments. Root canals, one visit or two, certain surgeries, are they prone to, if they're on bisphosphonates, are they prone to radionecrosis of the osteoradionecrosis of the jaws? So you do have to have your medical side in touch, even though you are focused on all three of these quite a bit. That is one thing I did, I do like about it and I do appreciate. One thing I will tell you, I took the MCATs, they weren't bad. So I figured the dental admission test would be a breeze because the MK, it's like the MCATs without the physics and without the uh, essay part, at least back in the day, I don't know how it is now. Um, but then I was like, okay, this is going to be pretty easy. It's not going to be a problem. I sat back, drank a beer. I was like, let me take this test. And then somebody told me that there's another part called the perceptual ability test. 
This is part of the DAT use. I did not understand what this was or why I needed it. For those of you who don't know, it's basically the most ridiculous thing you will ever see. They will fold a piece of paper into like 50 different folds of like an origami shape. You think a swan's gonna come out of it and then punch a hole and they'll ask you where all the holes show up. So when I saw this, I was just kind of dumbfounded. It took me a bunch of tries, but eventually I got through it. But a lot of this is because you're gonna be looking at teeth upside down and backwards. So whether it's through a microscope or through your loops for dental, when you're treating a top tooth, right's left, left to right, forwards back, back is forward as you're moving and cleaning out the area. So being able to recreate and render that, especially when you're rebuilding up a tooth, that's why all this perceptual ability is so important. Dental school, I will briefly talk about it. It was not a breeze. I thought it would be a joke because I was considering going to medical school, but instead it was the opposite. The first two years, actually, uh, my friend was in medical school at the same place and she was done at one. We were in the same classes, except at one o'clock, I would have to go take dental classes and she was done for the day and got to study. So your first two years are extremely tough. I would say probably even tougher than med school. One thing to look forward to that was year three and four, you're focused on clinical and it becomes a little bit easier than I would say med school rotations at that point, but you are working on patients. So it's a completely different type of stress. You can hurt somebody, you can injure somebody, and you will be at the beck and call of all of your team leaders, so to say, associate professors and professors, full-time faculty who have to sign off on stuff, who won't even let you get started unless you take the blood pressure and you could be sitting there for an hour. So all different kinds of stress, but it's definitely worth it. Um, the board exams will also be, very, might be changing now, but we have to find patients. One of my patients didn't show up. I almost failed the periodontal part of the board exam because I had to find somebody else who then needed a translator. And then I had to find a translator last minute. So again, it's all hopefully is changing to make it easier for you guys, but that's what the dental school trip was like. Um, as far as specializing, one of the ways I can say it is basically you can either be the buffet at the Bellagio or the Caesars, or you can be the filet mignon at Prime 112. For those vegetarian, I don't really know how to make a comparison, but long of the short, you can either be really good at a lot of stuff and spend your life kind of compounding those and doing good and learning more and more about each of those parts of dentistry and aspects, or you can focus on one niche and basically get in tune to that so that your cases may be extremely difficult, but they're, pro they're specific to that one niche and you will spend your entire life mastering that, getting better and better at that. Some of the specialties you can get into, um, maxillofacial surgery, periodontics, which is implants, and a lot of gingival tissue reconstruction and manipulation, um, pediatrics, radiology, where you do a lot of diagnostics to see what lesions look like on a 3D scan, a CT scan, learn how to read those. Um, endodontics, which is my field, which basically involves saving the tooth, but several other procedures. Prosthodontics, which are more like heavy cosmetic cases where you're doing full mouth reconstructions and rehabs, which you can, you can also do as a general dentist. But again, one thing I will say is in my dental school, my mentor for endo was amazing, kind of pushed me towards it. But my mentor for restorative or my teacher sucked and it pushed me away from general dentistry just because of my mentorship. So I will say, do not let that push you one way or another because just because you have one faculty who may teach you a certain way doesn't mean that that's the way it is. Um, I was too young and kind of wasn't really guided. So I got really scarred by getting away from general dentistry and restorative. And looking back, it was the best thing that happened to me. But at the same time, there's people in my class who had different faculty who are phenomenal dentists now and love what they do. So if you're not happy with something because of the way it's going in school, do not let that make or break your decision to specialize or not specialize because there's a world out there that you cannot let one person dictate. Um, I just built my own practice the summer of this past year, right before COVID hit. A uh, bit of a messy situation because I did a ground up startup. But um, I can delve into any questions about that later. We've been pretty successful. I just hired an associate. So that's been going good. But again, this is way out there for you guys. Um, and as far as endodontics, um, my biggest thing why I picked it was every tooth has a different set of anatomy, like different number of canals, different curvatures. So basically a root canal, for those of you who don't know, you open up a tooth, there's canal systems inside the roots. They're like tunnels. Now they can take different paths, different curvatures, your goal is to clean out those tunnels and then they're filling inside those roots. There can be rocks and different boulders inside the tunnels blocking you. There can be dilacerations or basically significant curvatures that make it difficult to get into, which is what your instruments are for, but they can break inside. 
all this basically, so every procedure when you get pretty good at it is straightforward until it's not. It's one of those that mishaps can happen like this, and then you're sweating, and then you want to go home and cry, or just drink a bottle of scotch, one or the other. But these are all different parts of endodontics that cause it a very high stress field. But like I said, the challenge is it's a lot of fun, and it's amazing, especially when you get pretty good at it and you start practicing more and more. Um, one other thing, one reason I picked endo was because you're basically always getting patients out of pain. And you're never selling treatment in a sense like, a lot of times you will have to convince a patient that doesn't understand why they need a crown, why they need a crown, um, why they need certain fillings, why they need this. With endo, listen, I can save your tooth if you wanna do the root canal. You wanna pull it, go ahead and pull it. It doesn't really break my back. So you never really are, having to push anything, which is kind of nice. It's a little bit of a stress relief because patients come to you when they want, and if they don't, they leave. It's it's not really much on you as far as having to convince them. Um, there's a lot of new procedures coming out, with regenerative therapy, which I did research on previously. It's basically recreating nerve tissue in uh, adolescent, well, permanent teeth in adolescents that basically have not had root formation due to trauma, and you can help regrow the nerve and dentin walls. That's still new. Uh, people are trying it. I have had one successful case, however, saying that nerve tissue regrew when a nine-year-old is telling you they can feel cold in the tooth is not really that accurate, in my opinion, because I tried it and I didn't touch anything cold. They said, oh, it was cold. So it's still a new procedure, but either way, let's them save their tooth. Um, okay. Just again, explaining the canal system, getting into that. Okay, uh, typical day, and I'll try to be brief about this so I can give them the treatments. Um, one good thing about dentistry, or at least my field, you can control your schedule. You can start at a certain time. But the biggest thing is, if you're a general dentist, you have to accommodate to your patients. If you're a specialist, you accommodate to your referrals more than anything else. Um, if they call you, they have an emergency, you need to be there because you are, they are your clients, so to say. General dentists, the patients are your clients, so to say. So. You try to get them in, you try to offer specials, do whatever you can to basically talk to them and build their relationship. Specialists, yes, you treat every patient with as the greatest bedside manner you possibly can, but you are seeing them once. So after that, you leave them with a final impression, but the people you're talking to on a daily are the general dentists and you wanna do everything you can to make sure they are confident sending patients to you and that you can help them when they're in the gym with their patients. Um, Doctor, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, there is a weird sound coming from your end. If you could please check, I'm not sure if um, what that is, but it's like a clicking sound. Um, I don't really I can try to turn off my AirPods, see if that'll do anything. Okay. Sorry about that. No, you're fine. Can you still hear me? Yes. Is it better? Yes, that's a lot better. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, Okay, so I'll just go through some of the um, some of the procedures. Uh, root canal therapy basically just involves uh, removing nerve tissue from inside the tooth, and basically then after you clean it out, you want to seal the tooth in three dimensions. Retreatment is when you're redoing another root canal. An apicoectomy basically means the apex is the end of the root. When root canals, the goal is to fill up the material to the end of the root and to clean everything out to the end of the root. When the infection comes back at the end of the root, whether it's because the tooth had an infection that turned into a cyst or the root canal did not fully cleanse it, you do a surgery where you basically go in laterally through the jaw and you remove whatever the infected tissue is. Uh, we also deal with trauma when people have their teeth knocked out, how to basically splint them, different medications you put inside the tooth to help regrow the root structure. Again, this gets into regenerative therapy, but there's other therapies as well. And then intentional replantation, which is a kind of a cool thing that you can do for teeth. It's case by case where that surgical approach I was talking about is not an option due to the fact that they have anatomical uh, complications in the area, whether it be a nerve sitting there, um, perforated too far into their sinus, et cetera. You basically extract the tooth, 
clean the end of the root, stick the tooth back in, suture it up, and see if it stays and heals. It's got about 60 to 80% success rate right now. And I just did one about four months ago that's in the process of healing. So it's pretty cool. I will briefly touch into these um, moving forward. Okay. Um, I'm basically going to log out of the presentation just because it's easier for me to just show you by clicking on this stuff instead of me going back and forth and copying and pasting all my Instagram. Standard root canal, um, just to get into it so you guys can kind of see what's going on. Here's a standard tooth right here, as you can see. Um, basically remove the metal. Sorry, doctor, to interrupt, but we're not able to see. I think you would need to share that screen separately. Okay. Yeah, you're still on the presentation. There you go. Perfect. Okay. So this is a standard tooth. Basically, what we'll be doing is we would remove the metal filling. This tooth, the tooth was inflamed. Patient had symptom, symptoms to cold, and it would not stop. It would like radiate pain to the side of their head. So we removed the old metal filling. This right here are the nerve chambers inside the tooth. So after removing this, we locate the nerves. There's one, two, three, four. These are the tunnels that go down into the tooth. After removing, we go into these tunnels and we clean out the nerves. Now this tooth you can see has a little bit of curvature, not too much. Once we clean everything out, you can see these little bubbles. That's the disinfectant solution we use. We then put a filling material inside the roots. So now they have one, two, three, four of the tunnels or canals that are filled. The patient then goes and gets a crown put on the tooth. Um, I will then go into another one, for example. Now with these, can you still see the screen? Yes. Okay, so now the complicated things with root canals and why sometimes people go to see specialists is if you look inside and you look at this one tooth right here, okay, this was a tooth that was treated, but when I look at it right here, here's the nerve canal and then it disappears. When it disappears like that, that usually means that about 13 millimeters down into the root, it splits into two separate canals. So when you think about that, you look underneath the microscope, it looks like just this, one straight canal, but actually, and this again is a, like I'm talking 10, 13 millimeters down, you'll see a second little hole and that'll be shown right there. And now you can see from looking at it from afar that there's a split and that there's two separate canals. So these are the kind of things that make it a little more fun and a little more challenging, but also again, make you feel like, you know what? I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this. And like I said, it adds to the challenging part of it. Um, here's another one that's, uh, so the other thing, I don't know if you guys know too much about this, it's called a cone beam CT exam. The cone beam CT is basically a three-dimensional recreation of the tooth. The nice thing about this, it actually lets you see the true anatomy of the tooth. When you look inside this tooth from bird's eye view, you'll usually see two canals. What you won't see is that this canal on the left goes, intersects, and crisscrosses with the one on the right. And the one on the right crisscrosses with the one on the left. Not only that, there's a bridge in between them. So the nice thing about this is sometimes when you fill the root canals and you actually take a 3D scan afterwards, you can see if you actually filled all of this or if you're missing some. So again, these are just basic root canals. That's some of the things that we do. I'll move forward into uh, briefly talking about retreatment therapy. So basically somebody else did a root canal that got messed up and for some reason you have to redo it. Now this, for example, this patient came in to see me. This is what her face looked like um, before I believe July 4th weekend. So she had a root canal that was previously done and for some reason there was a tiny infection. It looked small in the x-ray, but clinically her face was out to here. I opened up the tooth, I cleaned it out. This is before I even finished the root canal. Now she's back to normal. And so basically you can see here, this is the old x-ray, this is the old root canal. This little black shadow is bone that's broken down. The funny thing is if you look at the 3D scan, her root canal on one side was filled pretty well. On the other side, it's about three millimeters short. That three millimeters short led to about an eight by eight millimeter infection that then spread into her jawbone. So now me just re-cleaning it out and even filling it with a medicine went from this down to this. So again, one of the cool things about my specific field is just infection based only. You never really feel like you're not helping anybody. Um, a lot of times general dentists will do root canals and those metal instruments I was talking about, they'll break inside the tooth. 
So who do they send to? They refer to you and they ask you to help them out. And this is what you do. So this, this patient went to a dentist. They used a little metal instrument. They broke a metal instrument inside the entire tooth. So I had to use this tunnel shaped device to basically remove this entire instrument that was about 16 millimeters long. After that, I then went and cleaned out the entire root canal and then put a filling inside the tooth. These again are part of the retreatment procedures. These are not fun. You hate it when you see them in your schedule, but again, you do one of those for one of your referrals. Instead of getting you basketball tickets to the Bulls game or the Miami Heat game, they'll send you some really easy cases that'll be done for you in 15, 20 minutes, as opposed to the hour, two hours you might spend on this. Um, as far as apicolectomies, now these are surgical procedures. Now, like I said, when the root canal cannot be redone, and what I mean by that, I'll explain quite briefly, and I won't spend too much time on this. This patient here, if you look at this tooth, they had a root canal on this tooth up here. If you look at this tooth, they have a giant post inside the tooth. Now, that getting that post out generally can lead to a fracture of the tooth. So instead of breaking through their crown and removing this and cleaning all this out, we take a lateral approach. We basically lift up their gums and we'll go and remove this little abscessed area. We'll clean out the end of the root and we'll put a new filling in. So that's kind of what this entails. So we lift up the gums and then we basically find the defect. We scoop out the infection, we clean it out and we put a new filling inside the root. And that's what an apicolectomy is and then we stitch them up. So this is what I mean. We literally just went into the side right here and then we close them right up. Now, these are not, we don't do these every day. I tend to do them about once every week or two which is more than quite a bit of endodontist, but that's kind of just, if you want to, you can, if you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, briefly, when I said it is surgery, I'll just explain like all you're doing really, it's, it sounds a lot more complex than it is. You're just making a little cut into the tissue. And then after you make the cut, you're just gonna be flapping. And I'll kind of just let this video play for 20, 30 seconds. And again, this is because we have to go through the side and we can't, we don't want to risk going through the top of the tooth because we don't want them to lose it. So then you flap open the gums. And then once the gums are flapped open, we just go in through the side. And then one other thing that you have to be careful of, again, this is why with endo you do do, when you do do surgery, it is a very complicated procedure. It's not like placing implants. For example, this patient had an infection here. You see this post again, I was explaining that taking out posts can damage the tooth. The only problem is right underneath this infection is what's called your mental nerve. So if we look here, after I made a cut in the flap, this right here, is the patient's nerve bundle. And if you touch this, they will not be able to feel their lip moving forward for the rest of their life. You cannot sever that or cut that. So you have to make a hole up here, clean out the defect and put the filling here, all while being careful not to touch this little thing. So you do get to see nerves, you do get to manipulate nerves. And this again, whereas you get that whole surgical feel for some people who just have that little bug inside of them that they really wanna get into surgery, but may not wanna spend six years doing um, oral surgery residency. Um, as far as trauma, when people do get hit in the face, a lot of times the teeth come out, a lot of times the nerve will die and they'll end up basically with, um, they'll end up with like a black tooth. So as endodontists, even though we don't do cosmetic stuff, we can also do what's called internal bleaching. Patient gets a root canal in a tooth. You can see how dark their tooth is here. We put a little bleach on the inside. Now it's even whiter than their other teeth. Now this is not something that bleaching trays will fix or anything else, but this is a little bit of the cosmetic aspect in endo, but other than that, there's not much cosmetics to it. Um, now, as far as the intentional replantation, this is the new procedure that I was talking about. So when I explained that we go through the gums for the apicoectomy, now that procedure can only be done if we can actually see where, what we're doing and where we're doing. So with this tooth here, it's a second molar. Basically, what you'll see is that the tooth is way far inside the jawbone, so you cannot reach it. 
This patient's jaw nerve runs right here. So if I were to go in surgically through the gums, I would end up cutting this entire jaw nerve. The patient would lose all feeling. So instead, because the root is one shape, it's all one together, I can pull it out what's called atraumatically without damaging the socket that the tooth is in. So basically we remove the tooth and then we do that apical procedure outside the mouth. So we basically cut the end of the root where the infection was. And then we look at the end of the root. We clean the end of the root right here and we then put a filling inside. And you could see the smiley face because the tooth is pretty damn happy that it's not gonna be extracted. Now, after that, that's after we clean the infection from the end of the root, we clean the end of the root, we put the smile filling in, and then we stick the tooth back in. Now, three months later, I already have bone filling in the tooth. That's on another slide on my Instagram, but I don't remember if I linked it to this. But regardless, the goal is that in six months, this should fully fill in with bone. But you can go research it. This is one month follow-up, which is not significant because this may look lighter, but at one month, you're not really gonna have any bone. This could be the setting on the x-ray. It could be the angulation. So don't take this as healing because you're not gonna really get any actual healing at one month. The only thing you care about at one month is that the patient didn't knock the tooth out of the socket, that it's stable and is still in there. So now these are other alternatives for people to save teeth. Um, when I was applying to residency, endo was a dying breed because implants were becoming real big and everybody said endo was going to be gone. It's actually gone backwards, uh, believe it or not. The more educated the general population is, the more they do not want to lose their teeth. So in, from what I saw when I graduated to what I see now, it is night and day. And I cannot stress that enough that the field is actually at its peak, which I was shocked to see. But again, this is just something that I noticed and could be an observation varies by state, by city, by demographic, but that's just some of the stuff that I can uh, recommend or say. Um, and then again, back to the presentation, not much else, but that was the intentional replant. Feel free to look up any other cases. Like I said, I wanted to keep it somewhat brief because I don't wanna bog you guys down with all the procedures that I do. I'm happy to answer any questions and talk about it. My biggest thing is you just have to put in the work. A lot of people will say, oh, relax, things will happen for you. If you want it now, just put in the work and I promise it'll be a lot easier later. And I know you guys are an undergrad, so especially during COVID when you're not really doing much, I can't even imagine how difficult it's to study and focus. So, I mean, props to you guys for even getting through school at this time. Once again, I would like to say thank you so much, Dr. Singh, for your presentation. It was very informative. Um, we're going to go ahead and ask some questions that um, the students asked. Our first question is, um, who was your biggest influence to becoming an endodontist since you've mentioned that you're the first member of your family involved in dentistry? Um, my biggest influence was I would say my, one of my faculty members in my pre-doc era who kind of was just very finicky about the most ridiculous things. And he would just tend to care more about the patients being in pain than anything else. If somebody was complaining about a crown and they had an infection, he would just yell at the patient and be like, why do you care about the crown? You have an actual infection going on. And it kind of made me feel a little bit more of the medical side of it. And then after shadowing the postgraduate and just seeing the nonchalantness uh, of a lot of the faculty there where basically if the patient didn't want to do it, hey, you know, there's the door, you can walk right out. Just seeing that that confidence of just, look, you're here to do your job the best you can, you care about the patient's health more than anything else, it would be my biggest influencer. And my biggest influence was probably my, one of my pre-doc faculties. Okay, um, we have another question um, says, did you ever consider another dental specialty since you said that you like the artistic side of dentistry? Um, I actually just considered the only other field I considered was oral surgery. And that was more so because I found out I like the surgical side more than the artist side. And I hands down will say that a lot had to do with my mentorship and lack thereof when it came to the cosmetic side and i like i said i cannot stress that enough do not let do not make the mistake i made and let 
one bad apple ruin something that you have a genuine interest in. I did like the artist side, but again, having more of a pre-med and medical background and just caring more about health than anything else, I kind of realized quickly in a dentistry that the art, the art and the um, artisticness of like being able to do color matching, shade matching, um, get a person's smile exactly the way you want was not what I was drawn into as far as healthcare in the first place. So I kind of went backwards. Um, but the only other field I was interested in was oral surgery, but that was again because my lack of mentorship in a certain field. Thank you. Um, okay, so another question was, what is one thing that you wish you knew before starting dental school? That it's hard. <laughs> I am not kidding you. That's one thing I wish I knew because when I started, I would, I mean, I lived in Fort Lauderdale. So my whole thing was, okay, I'm in Fort Lauderdale from Chicago. It's warm weather all the time. Let's study a little bit, but let's just go out. Let's go to Miami. Let's have fun. I didn't really take it as seriously as I should have. And I wish I realized that one big thing I will to say is anybody who's even remotely considering specializing or doesn't even know, take your first year seriously because your first and second year your first year more than anything are where the courses will affect your ranking the most. I don't know how much you guys go by ranking anymore, but for me playing catch up my second and third year, trying to make up for the first year classes that I didn't really care as much about, no matter how smart you are or how hard you try, you could get, I went from average grades to straight A's because I was like, Oh, you know what? I want to do endo. And guess what? You can get straight A's your entire second year. If you are competing with people who did pretty darn good their first year and second year, you can end up in the bottom or just not nearly as good. And you will have to give up winter breaks. You'll have to give up spring breaks and shadowing and do externships. I did all that just to make up for my first year. So I would definitely recommend sorry, excuse me. just focusing your first year as much as possible. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, we have another question. She said from can you explain the suturing process in the endo case versus a general surgery suturing process? Um, it's kind of hard to elaborate, but in the endo cases, it depends. So basically in a general surgery, when you're saying general surgery, I'm assuming you're talking extraction, hopefully. If you're talking oral maxillofacial surgery where they're cutting open the face, out of my scope and I don't like talking about things out of, outside of my field, even though I can guess, I don't want to get into that. So if you're talking general extractions, basically a lot of times they won't even place suturers, but if they do, when you do an extraction, you place a bone graft and a membrane. The suturing is a little bit more technique sensitive because if you imagine here's an empty socket, I took the tooth out, now I'm placing, I place bone, I put a little membrane. That's to make sure the bone doesn't fall out. So now I have to stitch one side to meet the other side. What you can't do is you can't hook the membrane. So a lot of times you're gonna to have to push the tissue out and stitch through. Now, these are people who are really good at preserving the sockets, that's what you wanna do, which most dentists are kind of heading towards. You talk to guys who are 20, 30 years, they'll just put a sling suture and not even really care. Um, with endo, with our field, um, the nice thing is when we lay a flap, so to say, we don't really manipulate too much of the tissue, we're just repositioning it temporarily. So it's almost like lifting up the blinds. When you put the blinds back, you actually just do interrupted sutures along the vertical incision. And then along the horizontal, you have basically along the gum line, you have a choice to either do a cross suture where basically you go from one side over the tooth, back, and almost like a figure eight. But most people just go from the outside in, tie it, outside in, tie it, outside in, tie it. And the body itself does a lot of, a lot of the adaptation but the biggest thing with suturing in our field is since we are laying such a big flap that's a lot less sensitive when you do extractions or general surgery is how the patient takes care of it afterwards. Because for a socket and stuff, you can tell them don't use a straw and don't do this. And they'll listen because if they use the straw, they're gonna get what's called a dry socket. It pulls out the clot from inside the uh, socket and they'll be in excruciating pain. So they don't wanna do that. With us, if we tell them to be on a liquid diet and they decide to eat a salad and a piece of lettuce crawls up in between where the tissue was, they won't notice. They'll just kind of be like, hey, I'm still swollen. They won't really have much pain. They'll see you and they'll be twice as big and now you have to restitch. 
So a lot of the suturing is simpler in that sense, but it's more the post-operative care and the palliative treatment that you have to be very careful. All right, thank you for that feedback, Mr. Uh, Dr. Singh. So another question is about your undergraduate career. So what did you do in undergrad to prepare you for dental school? Um, is that a question from you? It's from someone else in the chat, but I guess they, they're asking you to elaborate on like your um, extracurriculars or maybe if you sure. did anything to build like your manual dexterity skills or anything like that. Um, so manual dexterity, no, I, I mean, I love painting and drawing. So I would enter uh, like, um, art competitions, but that's just for fun. Um, as far as extracurricular, I took a little bit of a different approach than uh, a lot of people did in the sense that one thing I noticed when I was pre-med was everybody was volunteering at the hospital. So I did that. Um, I did, I did the basics. I did like, um, try to find research. And like I said, I mentioned when I first started, was I couldn't get into any research. And so they had me do research in like the botany lab and like just work with plants and figure out how much carbon is in the end. Hey, you know what, it was something to put on my resume and I don't know anything about carbon and I don't remember anything about the plants, but it was on my resume that I was working in the science building. But those are all the basics. One other thing, one thing that I did personally, and this is just because I, I do like volunteering and service quite a bit. I always have, it's just been a big part of my family and my life was that I actually worked with teachers and kids in failing schools in Florida and basically would be in charge of like the kids and culture program where we would go to their schools. We would talk to them about what they want to be when they grow up. And like, these are second, third graders and they're telling you I want to be a football player because they see you coming from the University of Miami and they talk to you about all this stuff. So we go, we spend once like a month with them for like six months and we bring them into, we bring them over to the U and we'd have a couple science teachers do some science experiments for them and like where they'd see like the chemicals come up and like the gas explode from like a mountain and stuff like that. So they kind of be like, oh, wow, this is cool. And like, you kind of ask them in the beginning of the year what they want to be and you get people who wanted to be like um, just musical artists and football players and stuff to being like, oh, I, I want to see how that building was built. I kind of want to be, what is it called? Like an engineer or whatever. And you'd see them kind of switch into like seeing what's out there that they never got exposed to. So I did a lot of that. Um, I did a lot of involvement with like, um, we would introduce like a European day into the University of Miami where you get to know about other cultures. And I kind of hosted an entire day for the campus where we would bring in people from every, we hire different groups to kind of explain this part of like India, this part of uh, Scotland, this part of uh, Asia, this part of uh, Thailand, like not Asia, but uh, like different countries. And we would have them all kind of spread out and about, I also, um, I did tutoring quite a bit. Um, I just tried to diversify myself outside of what all the pre-health kids did. And I think that helped me quite a bit because it gave me a lot of experience that I got to talk about. And it put me in touch with a lot of people that were outside of the pre-health and pre-med field, which I, I think that's just an incredible life experience that you'll get that you'll never regret. That's super interesting, okay. So I have another question from more of the business side. Um, so are there any differences between opening a private practice as a general dentist uh, versus being an endodontist? Yes, so opening a private practice um, as a specialist is tricky, but I almost feel like it might be a little bit harder to open as a general dentist. Uh, maybe that's because my practice just hit the ground running, but I don't know. I will say it was extremely difficult, but my, I have to work with 20 to 25 general dentists at the minimum. And those are the people that I market to. And so if you're a general dentist in an area and you know about me, but you use a certain endodontist, but your patient's in excruciating pain and can't get in for a week, but I have an opening that day because I'm brand new you may be willing to give me a shot. And if I do the best quality of work and really care about that patient and they go back to say something, I've kind of earned your trust. So timing itself and patients in pain and need, it's like the, um, what, what's the saying? Um, the buy and demand, like if the demand is there, I have a chance to at least see the patient. Whereas as a general dentist, I feel like it's, in nowadays more difficult because you have so many corporations 
Aspen Dental, Heartland Dental, like all these big guns. Don't get me wrong. There are a few branches that I've seen that are okay that let the general dentist kind of run it the way they want. But for the most part, they have a bad rap. And that's because one of the staff members I know actually that works with me used to work at one of these. And literally their quota was to hit 300,000 in production a month. If they didn't do that, they would see no bonus, no this, no that. And it's like, you, these companies will pay you as a graduating dentist six figures and you'll be like, oh my God, that's amazing. And they'll tell you, you have to do this, this, and this. And the thing is, you don't even have to build a relationship with the patient. People just are putting in their schedule. So a lot of dentists get scared that, hey, that's an easy way to go instead of building their own. Because if they build their own, their entire day may be spent twiddling their thumbs, playing you know, call of duty in their office or doing something else because they literally have no patients coming in. You have to put out ads near like, you know, the Publix near you, or you have to put out ads in the, um, like on Instagram or wherever, social media for the most part now. But as a general dentist, I will tell you, when you open up and build relationships with the patients, the number of mom and pop style general dentist offices that are not focused on the patient care are getting lower and lower. And those are the offices that if you started your own, I think you would have a lot of success right now. It's just the entire world is telling you not to do that. Everybody is saying, just go work for corporate for a little bit, make a lot of money, and then open your own. But once you get sucked in, it's very hard to get out. And I do, so sorry, to, I'm going on tangents here. I think both have their challenges. Me personally and my personality, I think me opening a general dentist is a little bit more difficult given the area you're in. I think as a specialist, you may have a shorter ceiling. You may not be able to make as much as a general dentist if they, you know, open two, three offices and build like a booming practice. But I think getting off the ground might be a little bit easier. Uh, I have another question relating to like the business side of things. So what did you do to like gain a uh, business experience prior to you opening your own practice? Because I know for me, that's like one of the things I have reservations about because like I have no expertise in relating to business at all so I'm not sure like where to even begin I didn't either I have zero expertise I was supposed to partner into an office that was uh had been running for 20 30 years so all the business stuff was already taken care of it was a well-oiled machine that opportunity fell through so I had about six months to figure out what the heck I want to do and if I I had been working for four years so it was either I start at the bottom and work for someone. I wait another four years and then get the opportunity to partner in. Or I just look for a space and start to build. And I had no idea what I was doing. My, my wife actually gave birth um, last year to my, or two years ago to my daughter. The day my construction permit was born, uh, my construction permit was given to me. So I built the office and I built it big. I just kind of had some ideas. I Googled stuff, didn't, again, didn't really know what I was doing. Don't know about insurances, don't know how to get credential. Uh, so I paid a company to help me get credentialed with insurances. I opened in December of 2019. Um, <clears throat> the first two people I hired to work at the front desk um, were not the most savvy with insurances. So. After a few months, I realized no money was coming in. I still had no idea what I was doing. So it took a lot of 60, 70 hour weeks of just wanting to bang your head against the table. Um, but it figures itself out. And I cannot stress that enough. It's a lot less complicated than you think, but it just seems like a lot when you first look at it. Like somebody's telling you, this is a PPO, this is a HMO. They haven't had the copay and the deductible. I don't even know what the difference is between a copay and a deductible. Um, I didn't know what. Cigna versus Humana was and who we should take, who we shouldn't take. I don't know what the demographics are, what companies take what. When you hire somebody, that's the one thing I can tell you. And one person is your front desk and another person is your other front desk. All they do is answer calls, verify insurances, and deal with the patients, each of them. So they have three responsibilities. You do the root canals. So they will tell you, look, this insurance is only paying this much. You may want to keep in network, you may not. Or hey, we're behind on collections in this, just so you know, Dr. So-and-so, this is something that's going on. That's their responsibility, and I can't stress that enough, that you don't have to know at all. Like, you do not at all. And the whole business part, the biggest thing I can say is, um, for example, if you're a general dentist opening up, there's a company that I spent 500 bucks on called Dental Demographics. It's 
called Denta Graphics. Pick out 64 square miles that you want to open a practice in. They will do about 30, like two mile square radiuses and tell you, okay, the population in the last five years is on this trend. Um, the median income is this. The number of competition is this. We actually will have different circles. And you can see if the circle is blue, that means there's not many dentists there and the population is pretty damn good. They will rank them in top 10. 500 bucks sounds like a lot to you guys, but in, when you have a four or $500,000 loan, 500 bucks is nothing. It's less than 1%. So you invest in that and you take a look and you just blindly go off of it and be like, hey, I'm going to take a chance. Then you do things like, again, with the business sense, even if you don't know. You go to the village, you ask them if they know if there's a Starbucks or Walgreens or CVS opening nearby. If there is, they already did millions of dollars of research for you. You just take a chance and open, and then you'll see. Things will work themselves out, and it's easier than you think. Just nobody's willing to guide a lot of people, and that's why I, one of the webinars I did was opening a practice. And as an associate, a lot of times you're going to get undervalued, and you're going to have to work the Friday to Monday. You're going to have to work the shifts that nobody wants. You're going to have to take the insurance while the, the owner doesn't. And I don't think that's ever fair. I don't think you should ever get treated like that. So that's why when it comes to this kind of stuff, I mean, you guys are still ways away. Reach out to colleagues. They'll be happy to help. Hopefully, they'll be happy to help. Do you recommend being like a associate for X amount of years, say about six years before you like go into the risk of opening up your own practice just to have a feel of like how the demographic of where you can open up would be? Um, I would definitely say be an associate for two, three years, especially if you haven't done a GPR AGE, just because graduating with eight or nine root canals and 10 to 20 crowns is not the same as being in private practice and having somebody complain five times without having to check their blood pressure before you see them and all this stuff. It, it, you're just gonna learn so much about handling people, whether or not you want to open in the same area or not. I don't think you need five, six years. I think you know two, three years is great. I also think that if you can find a mentor that you may want to partner in with, that would be the ideal. But that's something you'll know after a year. I will honestly say if after a year, you feel like the relationship's going in a positive direction, I would bring up eventual partnership. If after a year, you know that this is not some, you don't like the demographic, the area is too far from home, you may not want to live here, but the mentor is awesome, stick with it for another two years, then bet on yourself. Bet on yourself more than anybody else because nobody else will. We have another question that says, um, what did you do in undergrad to prepare for your dental school journey? Um, I didn't. I kind of, uh, I graduated a semester early and I relaxed for about four or five months. I uh, worked at a, at a mall, a, a retail store. Uh, I enjoyed the last of it because that's the last time you're gonna be able to relax. And so I will say nothing's going to prep you for, I, I complain about 60 hours a week because it's doing root canals all day and it's um, dealing with patients and I have a family now and I got to plan for the future, et cetera, like that. But when you're in dental school, you're going to have three back-to-back -back exams. I can't tell you how many times you sleep in the library, you don't shower for two days, it's not a big deal. But the one thing, nothing's going to prep you for that. I mean, yeah, you can go to the library and sleep there in your boxers if you want for two days straight for no reason. I mean, that's a way to prep, but I don't think that's going to do anything long term. One thing I will tell you is work on your interpersonal skills if you don't have them or you feel like you got something you're lacking in because there is nothing like getting through dental school than camaraderie because you're in it with a class of 80 to 100. You find a group of four to five and, or even 10 to 20 or even two people to actually study with or I study by myself, but we partially studied together, but when it came to crunch time, last six hours for a test, we went our own ways. But the days before, it's a lot easier to get through the hardship that is dental school with partners than it is without. I cannot stress that enough. Um, even if you're an introvert, just having somebody there, just, you know, when you're exhausted, having somebody to bounce ideas off of or questions, that's one thing you can do to prepare. But as far as the mental and physical exhaustion, it's like a weed out system. You know how they say organic chemistry is like a weed out class? I almost puked during organic too because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I still don't know 
what key leading agents shaped in a diamond open up and then grab another agent? I don't even remember. So never going to use it, never did use it, but it was to scare you out. So I feel like in dental school, there are courses and the intensity is to make sure you can get through those exhausting moments. And if you can do it with someone, that's the best thing you can do, in my opinion, to prepare. As far as studying and stuff like that, a lot of the stuff just is just beating into your head over and over and over. And once you get through the DAT and the PAT, consider yourself lucky because if you get admitted and you get into school, the next part is just exploring. Some people had to study harder than others. Some people like studying at school. Some people like studying at home. Some people did audio books. That you're going to get to learn about yourself. So I know you're talking about getting to prepare, but it is undergrad. Undergrad is a break. It, it's just it, in America, we have it in European countries and other countries that don't because it's four years of just kind of quite a bit of goofing off, to be completely honest with you, or exploring and learning about yourself. And I took advertising. I wanted to drop out of uh, pre-med and go to Vegas and sell cars because I thought I'd be better at that. So that didn't happen. But there's a lot of different things you get to explore in undergrad. Dental school, you're not going to have time to do anything. So just learn that you're going to focus, but know that no matter how hard it gets, everybody's in it together. That's the one thing I think if you keep digesting that thought, it becomes a lot easier to swallow how difficult it is. And I hope that answered, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Um, was there any like study materials that you think really helped you when studying for the DAT? Um, honestly, I, for the most part, used like the Kaplan books. Um, but again, I had, taking the MCATs and did pretty well on those. And I think the MCATs are a little bit more challenging. So I, I have a skewed view on it. As far as the perceptual ability, I, I mean, the first time I took the test, I got a nine out of 30, like, like on a practice exam. So I really, I played a little bit of Tetris. I thought that might help, but it didn't. Um, so I'm sarcastic when I'm saying that, but realistically, it's just a lot of practice. That's what I would do. It's, I just did the ATT and uh, PAT books, and I really think taking that course helps quite a bit because a lot of the tests, they still are standardized. I know they're trying to get away from that, but they still are. Even though they're computerized and they've increased the number of questions and they kind of change the variability based on your response to the questions, they still have to standardize it to keep the admissions somewhat on an even keel. Okay, and I think one last question uh, we have is, what is one thing you wish you knew before starting dental school or like something you wish you knew before you started practicing? Uh, one thing I wish I knew before I started dental school was, um, again, how hard it is, but also I wish during my breaks at that time, I traveled a little more because you still don't have the responsibilities of the real world in a sense you're not working on patients and if you are you're not getting the blame if something goes wrong you also are with adults you're not with 17 18 19 year old college kids so everyone's 22 everyone's 23 24 everyone's super stressed so if you have a long weekend go on a cruise take a vacation with friends because you're never going to get that time back because you're still in this bubble it's like being in a glorified undergraduate bubble but you guys all have the same amount of funds. You guys are all kind of struggling, but you can still enjoy and you're not still getting, I mean, maybe you are still getting blacked out on the ground, who knows? But at the same time, you guys are all a little bit more adulting and you could experience Europe, you could experience a cruise, you could experience traveling a little bit more. Uh, I wish I did that. I wish I knew I was never gonna get that time back because now if I go on a trip, I, I may get calls from patients. I may um, have my old boss, if I was an associate reaching out to me saying, hey, this person's having excruciating pain. Do you want me to call them in a friend? Do you want me to do this? You have no mental relaxation. Um, that's one thing. As far as practicing, one thing I will say is my first year, I was told, oh my God, if I go to South Dakota, I'm going to make a lot of money. So, or if I stay in Florida, I won't make much. I, my plan was to stay in Florida for a year, make money, enjoy it, go out in Miami, have a time, or go to South Dakota, make a lot of money, then eventually go back to Chicago where my family is. One thing I will tell you is when you graduate, take this seriously because wherever you end up starting practicing, even as an associate, majority of the time, those roots that you plant in that area are going to be extremely difficult to leave. Getting involved with just the community or if you're a specialist with the dentist and with your local branches for two, three years, then having to start at ground zero, you will be very, it'll be a lot more difficult to leave that than you think it would. 
So a lot of people think, okay, I'm going to do this for a couple of years and then I'll go here. I would, and I, that was advice given to me right before I was applying for positions. And I 100% I agree with it. And I seriously recommend that to anybody who's practicing. Keep in mind that where you go, no matter how much you think you're not going to stay there, you, you may very, very well end up staying there just because it's so difficult to start from ground zero again. All right, thank you for the feedback. I think we have one more question. It's, if you could repeat it all over again, would you still pursue dentistry? A thousand percent more than I would have before. Okay, well, um, I guess that brings it to an end for our session tonight. I would like to thank you so much, Dr. Singh, again for um, informing us about your specialty and answering all of the questions very honestly. Um, to everyone in Predental Universe, I will be sending you guys the quiz link um, in the groupie chat. So be sure to look out for that. It'll be open for the next 24 hours. And um, yep, thank you guys for attending tonight's session. I will also um, send Dr. Um, Singh's email. If you guys have any questions, um, feel free to ask him if that's okay, doctor. Yeah, you can reach out to me, social media and emails. I honestly try to answer as much as I can. If you're ever in Chicago and want to come chat or check out the practice, I'm all for paying it forward and helping everybody out because I know it's a very tough time and sometimes everybody's caught up in their own little bubble, but I'm all, I'm an open book. I'm easy. Anything you want to know, just shoot me a question. I'm happy to Okay, well, um, I will stop the recording now.